Hi and welcome to the Peak Endurance Podcast. My name is Isabel Ross and I'm the coach at Peak Endurance Coaching. Episode 87 is an interview and discussion with Luke Nelson, chiropractor at Health and High Performance. In this episode, we discuss the issue that many runners face and are plagued by, plantar fasciitis or PF. This is a second in a series of interviews related to the injuries runners face. I'm sure you'll find this series extremely helpful. If you are like the majority of runners, you may feel like you are constantly beset with niggles, a euphemism for injuries, that take away from your joy of running. As you can tell from these podcasts, Luke is extremely knowledgeable about the issues that runners face. He will help you get back to running your best, if not better. Luke treats the root of the problem, not just the symptoms. So if you're sick sick of niggles, come in and see the specialists at Health and High Performance, where they utilize the latest in technology and experience to help you get back to your running best. Head to healthhp.com.au forward slash run to book an appointment and ensure you can run strong and free. You can also find them on Instagram, Health High Performance. Thank you so much for supporting the podcast and the YouTube channel. I really appreciate the people who take the couple of minutes out of their day, and I know it's a hassle, to get onto Apple Podcasts to rate, review and subscribe. I read all of the reviews and they sure do inspire me to keep working hard on this podcast. Thanks so much. If you enjoy this episode, please also go on over and rate and review and subscribe. I am aiming for 100 reviews by Easter. Will you help me achieve my goal? If you find that post lockdown your training is a bit disorganised and haphazard, email me isabel at peakendurancecoaching.com.au And I can help you with a structured, individualised plan that takes into account your life and your running needs. If you want more information on Planter as well, there is a link in the show notes to a blog on this topic. I hope you're finding this series informative. If you would like a particular topic covered, email me, isabel at peakendurancecoaching.com.au or comment on the Peak Endurance Coaching page on Facebook or the Peak Endurance Podcast Instagram page. Enjoy the interview with Luke. Excellent. All right. Well, hi, Luke, and welcome to the Peak Endurance Podcast once again. Thank you. Yes, good to be back for, for the third time then. That's so right. Not, not all right. right. Not all right. You're a regular and, and that will continue to be so because there's so many running injuries yeah. that we can go to, sadly. Unfortunately, yes. yes. Um, now, the next one that we are planning on talking about is uh, one that plagues many a runner, plantar fasciitis. Can right. you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, so so today's talk, we're, we're going to talk about um, plantar fasciitis or otherwise known as plantar heel pain and, and we'll talk about some of the, the names it's also, also known as. Um, but firstly, what is the, we talk about just to give everyone a good understanding of, of what the plantar fascia is. But basically what the plantar fascia is, is you've got your, uh, got your foot and there's a, a sheath of, of a big sheath, a big ligament, if you like, underneath the, the underside of the foot there. And what its job is to, to provide support uh, and, and also to, to help um, uh, store and release energy there as well. So it's quite, it does a, a, a huge role to play. Obviously, a lot of force goes through our, our feet when we're running. So the plantar fascia is really important for, uh, for that stability and that, uh, that load transfer from the foot right up and through the, uh, and through the leg. Um, we also know that the, the actually the calf and the Achilles are continuous with the, the plantar fascia as well. So the calf and the Achilles come down, wrap around there and, and attach into that and become continuous with that plantar fascia. So there's some, some interaction that we have between. And last time on our last talk, we spoke about, uh, about calf injuries and there's yeah. certainly some similarities in managing these with the, uh, with the, the plantar fascia as well. So, because you'll often find someone with plantar fasciitis tends to have tight cans. Yeah, ab- absolutely. And that is also something we're going to, we're going to discuss yeah. as well, but that is something definitely we, we find. So, um, so as you mentioned before, and, and, and with the, the name plantar fasciitis, it goes by many different names and, and that includes uh, policeman's heel, heel spur syndrome, cal- subcalcaneal pain, joggers heel, plantar fasciitis, as we said, plantar fasciopathy, which is the term that we tend to use, okay. um, and plantar fasciosis. So we tend to sort of put everything in, in the, and call it plantar heel pain. It's just, just easier. 
Um, and uh, and so that's what we will, I'll refer it to, but you can call it whatever you like. But uh, <laughs> as long as our, our listeners know that, that we're talking about the same thing, that's, yeah. uh, that's it. Um, so some of the symptoms that we find with with, um, with plantar heel pain. So it, it's typically people will say, oh, it's a pain underneath underneath my heel. Um, usually at the at the right at the ball of the foot there. So if we've got our, our skeleton here, it's usually right down the down the base here. Often a little bit more on the inside of the heel as well. So they sort of point with a, a finger down there. But often a lot of people can have pain that spreads down their feet. So we can see on the on the uh, image here we can see that a lot of people actually experience pain traveling, traveling down the feet there. So mostly the, the predominant pain is around the, around the heel, but some, some it can actually go down the heel. Um, then we can also see quite typically, this is the, the sort of pain that people will get first thing in the morning. So they wake up out of bed in the morning, it's like, oh, yeah, it takes me, takes me a few steps to, to get going and, and, and loosen things off. Uh, same thing also applies after after being sitting for, for a long period of time as well. So if they've sat down for a while and they go to stand up and, and it's like, oh, it takes a few steps to, to warm up. Uh, so that's quite uh, quite some of the, the, the common characteristics that people will feel. So if you're, you're listening and you're saying, oh, yeah, tick, 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 that's me, this is like what we're, uh, what we're dealing with. So, but a couple of other things we must consider and, and, and uh, always important that we, we do get a diagnosis so we know exactly what we're dealing with. And, and some of the other things that it can be around that area are things like a, a fat patty rotation, which is like a, a cushioning on the underside of our heel. So that can be irritated in, in some people. It can also be a nerve involvement there as well. Uh, and then it can also be a dreaded stress fracture. So they're the mm. ones, fortunately not as common as what the, what the, the plantar heel pain is, um, but, um, but certainly things that we need, to, what we need to consider with those. Now, one of the things and, and one of the names you saw, we mentioned earlier on that this is known as is, is a heel spur syndrome. And, and a lot of people will come to us and say, oh yeah, I've, I've, got a heel, I've got a heel spur or I've been diagnosed with a heel spur. So what we know about that is that, that heel spurs are, are relatively common. So 12% 12 of the population have got them. Um, we know that they're more likely seen in those with other sort of conditions. So if they've got osteoarthritis or other low limb pain, they're, they're more likely to have them. Okay. But they're not necessarily the culprit. So because you've got the heel spur, it doesn't mean that that's why you've got pain. And quite often we find that, and because you know, twelve percent of people have got have got these, a lot of those have not even got pain. Yeah. Uh, and then we find sometimes with with those people that come in with plantar heel pain and they've got a heel spur. The pain goes away, the heel spur remains. And so the heel spur, we never really worry about that. So people okay. sort of can sometimes say, oh, I've been diagnosed with heel spur and you know, I've got this big bone growing out there. And thinking that the only way to heal it is to get that, that's an operation, get that changed off. Exactly yeah. right. And, and, and often what we find with that, so with that heel spur is it's actually the, the body sort of laying in some bone to try and sort of strengthen that area around there as well. Okay. So it's giving some, giving sort of, some support in around that, so where that that uh, plantar fascia attaches into that into the heel. So yeah, we don't tend to worry about that. So for all our listeners and viewers out there that have been told this, don't panic about the uh, about the heel spur. It's more the uh, the plantar fascia that we want to uh, we want to work on. It's good to know. So now we're going to work into we're going to talk about some of the some of the things that that you can do uh, at home and that, that we often will give our our patients to um, to for, for rehab and, and yeah. to uh, to treat things. So firstly, strong feet. And I think it makes, it's pretty common sense um, that uh, you know, this plantar fascia is, is supporting the underside of the foot, but we've got a whole heap of muscles there on the underside of the foot that do exactly mm. exactly that. Um, and, and runners, I mean, we're on our feet. It, it makes sense to have strong feet. We spoke about uh, strength like last year mm. and how important it is. So, yeah. Exactly. So so getting that get strengthened through those, those uh, smaller muscles in the feet there yeah. can be really important. In fact, in in uh, children's 2016 study, they found that, um, that those with plantar fascia issues uh, and plantar heel pain had a, a loss of volume in those, in those muscles compared to, to matched controls. And this was yeah. done in, in a running, running population as well too. So, so they found that, that the volume and, and a decrease in muscle volume is, is associated with decreased strength. So that they actually were, you know, you could, could apply that they were weaker in those, uh, those foot muscles. So how, what's some things that you can, you can do at home? So one of the things that, uh, that are, are some good tests that I like to get people to do at home uh, are what's called toe spreads. And so what that involves, and this is also referred to as toe yoga, but actually just simply spreading your toes. And you can see in the video oh, okay. there, but uh, it's just trying to spread those toes apart. And some people just look at their feet and there's absolutely nothing yes, happening there. Um, and, uh, and one of the, the things is that because we are in, in shoes or for a lot of us in shoes all of the time, we haven't learned, we've lost that skill of being able to, to spread and, and use those smaller muscles of the, uh, of the feet there. So that's one, one test that we use. The other test as well, you can see in that video is alternating the toes. So we can sort of go oh, okay. big toe up in the air, 
and remaining toes up in the air and alternating that back and forth and getting that yeah. getting that control. And again, some people find that really tricky and, and challenging, but it, it, it can be it can be a tone. It's like like a lot of things. You just got to I've got to practice it and get that get that strength there. Um, I like the toe spread exercise uh, as well as a as a rehab. So that's just you know spreading the toes as wide as you can. What that tends to do is it tends to activate um, the the inside muscle of the of the foot there. It's called the abductor hallucis brevis. But basically, it it serves a really important role in supporting that arch and, and therefore yeah, okay. the plantar fascia. Yeah. So if the plantar fascia is cranky and, and and irritated and it's being overworked. Well, how about we give some support to those muscles? You know, build yes. up those muscles of the foot and, and give that plantar fascia some some support there. So so I like the other toe spreads there. Um, the other ones, there's other exercises that we, we use there as well too. This is going to go through. Oh, this is going on video. Yeah, hang on. There we go. Um, so the toe yoga, as I said, those, those alternating toe ones. Banded toe flexion. So we can use the, use the band yeah. there and put a band around the, the big toe and try to push that down into the ground. Put some bands around the remaining toes and push that down into the ground there as well. And then calf raise splits. So what that is, is, is and the video I just showed before, but basically raising up on, on both feet on your tiptoes and then you sort of spin your, your heels out, lower down, and you sort of keep spinning your feet in and out and, and raising up and down. So it gets the calves working at the same time, um, and, but also those, uh, those, those small muscles of the, uh, of the feet. Then another one that we can, another exercise that we can use is, is what's called a modified calf raise. Um, and what this involves is getting either a rolled up towel so you stand on a stand on a step like you would do, normally do a, a calf raise, and get a towel and put it underneath the toes. So it's right. underneath the toes there. Uh, the other thing that you can use is you can actually use one of these these devices here called a, a fasciata spider, and you can see in the image there. But these are these are just a, a simple bit of foam that's got a bump in them, and basically your foot rests on 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 this part, and then your toes go onto the bump. So what that's yeah. doing is it's essentially forcing forcing the toes up into an upward position and what that does is that creates an activation of this uh that puts a greater strain through that uh, through that plane of fascia so what we do is we either use one of these devices there underneath the toes or we use the rolled up towel underneath the, the toes there and then we slowly go up into our calf raises so you know three seconds up yeah. pause at the top for two seconds slowly lower down for three seconds and then and then pause there again so nice and nice and slow However you want to go, we actually want to go quite heavy on these. So for and, and in the program that was used, so you would add weight. Yeah, definitely, definitely mm -hmm. add weight. So um, the, the one of the, the, the studies that looked at this um, was by Michael Raffleff, and they they had a program which is what what uh, we're, we're putting up through here. So in weeks one and two, you'll do twelve reps, yeah. um, but but weighting it so that you're not able to get past twelve. So you're getting yeah. twelve is like, yep, I'm done uh, for three sets. And then weeks three and four, you go drop it down. So you, you go to 10, a 10 rep max. And so you're adding more weight on there to make it heavier, uh, but going for four sets. So adding a bit more work into, into that there as well. Uh, how we can add weight to that? Well, we can put either weight in a backpack or we can carry some books. And so there's lots of different ways, lots of different ways that we can, we can do that there. Uh, and then in the, the fifth week and fifth week and beyond, we're again dropping the reps down to ace. We're adding more weight on there and also adding another, uh, another, another set on that there as well. And keep doing that as you get stronger. Yeah, that can be done. That can be done every day. Um, okay. And I usually tend to prefer though every every other day, every yeah. second day with that because Just especially to give it going some time. exactly yeah. right because we're going heavier as well. You know, you yeah. can really you really fatigue things. The added bonus with the exercise too is that you're getting a good workout through the car. So now, should you do those before or after a run? So or at a can, completely separate time. Well, yeah, a really good question. So what what people find is that they um, especially if they get that that pain early in the run um, and they're sort of like, oh, I'm really hobbling for the first K or two. Yeah. This is a, it can actually be a really good thing to do at the start and, and it really gets Unless a warm up. up. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and so this is where the, this exercise in itself can actually give people some good pain relief. Yeah. The other thing we can do with this exercise is we can turn it into what's called an isometric. Okay, So basically an isometric means you don't move. So an yeah. isometric hole. So what you can do is get in the same position. So have the rolled up towel underneath the toe there on the step, and then you raise up just a slight fraction. So just raise up a little bit, yeah. still holding your weight and hold that position there and try and hold that for, you know, even, even as high as 45 seconds, but usually around yeah. sort of 30 yeah. seconds yeah. and holding that there. And that can actually, again, give some good pain relief. So, so you can either go with the, uh, my preference is usually with the raises um, yeah. first. Because, and, and then if that doesn't give the pain relief, try with the isometrics and if they do, then great. And you can, you can yeah. stick, with, uh, stick with those before you run. 
but I would still prefer to strengthen through range with, with doing a raise. So that's a that's a really good point because yeah, you can it can really help to to get people you know start the day off well. You can do these yeah. in the morning, get things feeling better, and uh, and then and then not be hobbling through the uh, through the morning. So always nice not to hobble. Well, it is, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> that's right. So then we've got uh, another thing that, that also that um, Michael Rathliff looked at in his study was a particular type of stretch. And what we do with this uh, this this plantar fascia stretch is you simply have the foot up on your other knee, so you're sitting sitting cross legged. And you basically grab your big toe and just yank it back as, as far as you can. And, and what you can see on, on the, uh, the image through here, but you'll see, you'll actually see the plan of fascia become a bit more yeah. prominent and it actually sticks out a bit. And, uh, and you feel that's where we sort of want to feel the stretch. So really pulling that toe back there and, uh, and we're holding that for, for 10 seconds uh, and repeating that 10 repetitions and doing that three times a day. Now, that was the protocol that's used in the study. So it's quite a lot. So, you know, you're doing yeah. it, you know, 100, 100 seconds and, and doing that three times a day. So it does take up a bit more time than what the what the uh, the strengthening does with those uh, those modified calf raises. So we sort of look at it and think, well, should we strengthen or should we stretch? Which one which one should we do? Now, firstly, you can do both if you want. Yeah. But in order to save time, Michael Rathler looked at comparing these two. What he found is he found that the strength group did better in the short term. They did better at, at sort of three months, but later on down the track at six and 12 months, they were actually similar improvements. So it's okay. sort of the, it's sort of the same. Time. Exactly right. So yeah. it can come down to it can come down to preference, like what, what you feel, you know, what feels better for you as well. Is it, do you feel better with that yeah. the stretch or does it feel better doing those, those raises? Okay, can yeah, I ask, doing this. Would, would doing the strength though be more of a preventative for it happening again? And that's the other thing too. That's where we've also got to look at the added benefits that yeah. go along with that. So with the stretching, you know, it's fairly isolated to the plane of fascia. Right, yeah, yeah, you're getting a little bit of a stretch with the big toe. So perhaps if you're lacking some mobility in through that big toe, it's a good one to do. But if you're you're wanting to, you know, the added bonus of building some calf strength, and who couldn't, you know, who couldn't get more calf? Who yes. doesn't need more calf strength? Um, is is then opting for the for the the, the heavy slow raises, and that that's usually my preference. Yeah, is I'll try and move I'm people sure. to that. Yeah. If it's someone that's fairly inactive, and you know they, they don't really want to be doing uh, you know any exercise, which I'm, I'm you know yeah. always trying to push them towards, uh, and fortunately, hopefully none of our, our listeners are today. Um, but yeah, always trying to sort of go towards the, the strength side of things yeah. to get that. And, and obviously, if they've got a loss of strength, half strength as well, well, then they can kill two birds with one stone. Yeah. So so prefer the strength. Now, as we, we spoke about on our last one, and I mentioned this image, yes. and I forgot to put it in, so I just had to slide into this <laughs> one. But uh, it is but it's one. yeah, running running so important for the uh, for the calf. So, and as you mentioned early on, you know, and, and that that calf coming down into the Achilles and attaching yeah. to the plantar fascia, really important work on the calf strength. And you can sort of refer back to our, our previous uh, previous episode we did yes. talking about some of the exercises that can be done for the uh, for the calf because they do they are the most most common uh, most. Uh, and the, the, the muscle that does the most work in your running. Can I muscles. ask a question? Normally when people have, uh, talk about their plantar fasciitis, they talk about having to roll their foot on the bottle of frozen water. Yeah. You haven't got that in there. Well, no, you, you, you're preempting me here. We've got, oh. uh, we're, we're, we're getting there. But, okay, uh, sorry. So, yeah, so that's right. But, um, in a couple of slides time, we'll, okay. we'll get there. Um, no, the, um, so the, the other thing that we want to do as well is also we want to be addressing plyometrics. So yes. you know, we mentioned that, uh, you know, with, with uh, strength and, and going, going, again, going back to our, our previous episode, but you can see on this, this image here, the requirements on, and this is the Achilles, but it does also apply down into the uh, into the foot there in the plantar fascia. Um, when we run, you know, doing just doing simple calf raises isn't enough to replicate those yeah. forces that, that are needed there. So we need to be doing things like jumping, skipping, hopping, pogo jumps, not a good one, bounding, uh, and uh, yeah, so a few. Different and and how often would we should come and be doing those? Plyometrics, we tend to just keep it at once a week. So yeah. prefer to keep that uh, just once because that they are they are more load on, on there. Yes. And they need to be done at a certain point. I mean, when people are coming in with a really raging and sore uh, plantar fascia, you're not going to get them doing a lot of skipping no. and jumping to begin with. There's there's certain, I mean, there's, there's lower level plyometrics and pulses are a good one. We, we yeah. spoke about that last time, which is basically doing calf raises, but just at the faster speed. Um, so the um, that's a, a one that you can introduce early, but yeah, you need to be at a certain level to introduce uh, introduce these in. But yeah, just once a week, once a week with those okay. ones. Yeah, low die taping is something that I that I use quite uh, quite a bit, and that can be a really good one for for especially when they're they're quite you know a really acute stage and they're really sore. So it's a particular type of taping that we apply, and it's probably easier to well for our, our listeners on the podcast to refer back to uh, 
Uh, we don't want to post a link or, or, um, or refer to the, uh, the, the Facebook Live that we're doing there. It's got an image of, of the taping. It's really easy, uh, something I'll instruct uh, all, all my plantar, plantar heel pain patients how to do themselves at home so they can actually take their foot up for a run. And, and some it can actually result in, in quite significant relief for. Um, and uh, so that's a good and, one and to, the, to you know, A lot of the tape that's popular at the moment is um, you know, similar to rock tape and yep. those sorts of things. Can that be used yeah, for this? And, yeah, yeah, it can okay. be. You can use the rock tape, you can use the dynamic tape, you can use the, the rigid strapping tape. So yeah. any of those. My preference is usually more towards the more rigid ones. That's what I was, it does that's give, I was asking. Yeah, yeah. But, it, but it does work. I, I do use, especially, see, yeah, yeah. especially for those that, because uh, the problem with, one of the problems with rigid tape is you, you can't leave it on the foot for, for a no, long period true. of time. Yeah. Whereas with the stretchy tape, the kinesio type tape, you can often leave that on for days. And yeah. so if it's something that we really want, we want people to be doing quite a bit of, then that's why sometimes I'll opt for the stretchy tape. Yeah. Not as much support, but it, but it, um, but it can stay on for longer and, yeah. and, uh, and, give, and it won't irritate the skin. So... So yeah. that's a yeah, good question. You can use use alternate tapes there. Then we've got our other, and here we go. This is okay. uh, this is in the massaging through there. So we've got our calf stretching. You mentioned before, you know, quite often, and we see that a lot too. Those with plantar fascia issues often have stiff ankles and, yeah. and stiff calves, and often a loss of range there. And a number of research studies have also supported that too. So that's something that, that we that we will give um, for those that are lacking that mobility. Yeah. Um, so you know, we do our knee to wall test, which yeah. uh, we may have discussed before, but basically trying to you know, get that drive that knee over the toes and, and see see what that range of movement's like there. So if we're finding that people are quite stiff through that, yeah. then we'll get them uh, to be doing some doing some stretching. Uh, then we've got our self massage. So this is what you know the, the frozen the frozen mm -hmm. coke bottle, uh, the massage ball through there. Because I just I'm 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 sort of I find I have a little concern with the coldness. Does that not stiffen up the muscle? Uh, no, it doesn't. But the cold, oh, where the coldness, the yeah, yeah. Where, where the coldness works is it, it just it just numbs the area. So right. it actually gives you it's know more for pain relief. Really absolutely, it is. Yeah. So something sore, you put some ice on it, it makes it feel a bit better. Um, the massage ball, yes, you definitely can roll in through that yeah. uh, through that underside of the foot there. Just sticking around the media point. Don't go around where the, the sore point is right yeah, at the heel. Yeah, yeah, don't run around that because that will Why tend is that? to it'll just annoy it. It's, it's yeah. already annoyed as it is. And so yeah. so I tend to just recommend just going into the meaty part of the arch, just rolling, rolling around yeah. through that. And you can use anything. You can use a golf ball as a common one as well too. Golf ball, massage ball, spiky ball. Um, you know, what about theraguns? Balls. Yeah, theraguns as well too. Same applies okay. with that. So that's all fine to use the gun on the underside of the foot there, but just staying away from where that, where that's, uh, that, that foot in, inserts into there. Uh, then we've got a foot orthosis. Now, foot, a foot orthosis or foot orthotics, um, I don't tend to, uh, when, when people are in a really acute stage, it's often not a good time to be putting something in the shoe there because uh, in, in terms of an orthotic, because it, it actually can sort of press up into that area and it's mm -hmm. often not well tolerated at an early stage. Yeah. Later on down the track, and if there's something that's quite recurrent and, and chronic, then this is where, where a, you know, foot orthosis can be quite useful. And I've heard of people having heel raises. Is that a similar thing or something heel different? Heel raises we don't tend to use as much for um, for this. Oh, okay. uh, you can use, if there's if there's some involvement at the fat pad, which you can have multiple things happening at once. Mm. You can have, you know, plantar heel pain and also a fat pad involvement. That's when you can use a heel cup can actually yeah. work quite well for that or, or a gel insert. A gel yeah. insert there to provide a bit of push. That's more to that. relieve the pain than anything, isn't it? Yeah, it yeah. is. And that's more, we use that more for um, more for the, the back pad than we do yeah. for, the, for, that, okay. for that tendon that it can insert down through there. So don't tend to use that as as much. Um, for the Achilles, yeah. yes, we will put a, put a heel lift ah, in for, okay. for that. That's, yeah, that's right, more for the Achilles. So that might be something we'll talk about in the, yes. yeah, in the, in the coming one. That's uh, another common injury so, there. Yeah. That's, yeah. Uh, that's yeah. right. <laughs> Um, and then shoe wear as well too. So, and this is often the discussion that we'll have with the with the runner about what they're currently wearing. Um, you know, maybe they've, they've transitioned to into a, a different type of shoe a bit too quickly, uh, and so we might need to you know to look at look at ways around that. Generally, I, I don't tend to if someone's been using the same type of shoe for a while and they've got this condition, I'm a bit hesitant to change shoe wear immediately straight away because you can. Uh, you can put too much stress on, on that yeah. area. So I'll tend to sort of look at other areas to begin with and look at things like strength and, and things to yeah. work on. And, and then we can then look at uh, address the shoe wear and see what's appropriate for that individual. So, I mean, generally when you get planter, it's from increasing the load too quickly as mm -hmm. opposed to the, the shoe itself. 
sell. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And that's one of the things that we'll talk about with our runners and having a really good good discussion about in that, you know, what, what triggered this to begin with. Yeah. And, yeah. and it, it often is a change in load. So it might have been that they've just ramped up their mileage or they had a quiet week and then they went back yeah. too quickly. Um, or they were in lockdown and only able to run once, one hour a day and yeah. then they went bang. We're free and then off we go. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Or they've come back from another injury and then they've, you yes. know, they've, 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 they've resumed too quickly there. They've done a lot of downhill running because that is a lot of oh, downhill okay. running, especially is a lot of, lot of impact on the, uh, on the, 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 yeah. the so um, with that. Trail and ultra so, runners take yeah, note. That's yep. exactly right. Um, they're sort of some of the common triggers. Shoe wear triggers. Uh, will be if someone's gone for a more minimalist type of shoe and then that can do it or barefoot like coming into yeah. summer as well people yes. now it's like break out the thongs and they yeah, start wearing yeah. the thongs and so it is often something we'll see after a uh, you know people have been up to a trip a holiday up to Queensland and you know it usually happens mid-winter uh, yeah. they go up to Queensland they wear thongs for a week they're walking around and they come back with these plantar heel pain yeah, um, because okay. their feet just aren't used to it you know thongs can actually be quite good to strengthen the uh, yeah, strengthen yeah. the feet um, but you've got to be ready for them and you've got to, you know, transition them much like you would with any other shoe wear. So, so train to wear your thongs. Train to wear your thongs, exactly <laughs> right. With summer coming up now, that's yeah. uh, just gradually, gradually, uh, gradually bring them on. Yeah. Uh, then we've got into our into our others as well. So we've got things like um, shockwave. Shockwave is a is a type of uh, type of, of treatment that can be used. Um, and I'm, I'm guessing this is for more chronic cases. Yeah. Right? It's it's again like for, for the acute ones. These aren't usually my my go to. Yeah. Um, we usually try and go for these these other options first. Um, shockwave is it doesn't do anything to build strength in, into yeah. the foot. There, it does help to sort of quiet and settle these down, as do some of these other inter interventions here. So things like anti-inflammatories. Uh, injections as well uh, and yeah so those those sort of three things I don't tend to use as much to, yeah. to manage these if yeah. they're really if the pain is really predominantly and it's just not going away with, with everything then that's when we can look into these other things or if we've got a, a race that's coming up and we just need to get this this under control yeah. and we just need to pull out all the stops um, but it's it's not usually my my, my go-to things to, uh, to, to to do all those yeah. Um, especially the injections. It's fortunately yes. very few that we would have to, yeah. I don't, would have had to have sent off to uh, to have, have injected. And the worst case, you know, surgery, but touch wood, never had any, that yeah. had, to, uh, had to send off for, uh, for surgery there. Then we've got our return to finishing up now. We've got our, our return to So return obviously to yeah. in saying that then with return to running, yeah. um, is, is your implying that you have definitely deloaded yeah. But not stop running. Would you stop someone completely? It depends. So if we've got so if if, if someone is able to uh, and, and and like a lot of lot of these running conditions, if, if someone's got a, a fairly stable pain that it's at a you know a four or five out of ten, yeah. uh, then then we can keep them uh, keep them going. Uh, if we're finding it's flaring up above that, or yes. it's you know they're waking up the next day feeling really sore, so that four or five out of ten applies when they're doing the run, but it also applies the day after and, 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 yeah. and that evening as well. So if they're waking up the next day and it's, it's really really sore, well then we need to we need to be modifying the running yeah. load. So so tweaking the running loads is is a big part of, of yes. what this and, and and also communication with the with the coach is, is really important as well to you know collectively and collaboratively work together. To, to how we can get this, you know, how we can keep this runner running because that's always my preference. If we can try yes. and keep the runner going and try and keep them doing something, it's, you know, fortunately, it's it's not that common to have to say, now, look, you need to stop. Sometimes yeah. they get really bad and, you know, people can't even walk. So yeah. it's like, well, if you can't walk, then, you know, yeah, you're not going to be able to, not okay. gonna be able to run. So yeah. so um, sometimes it gets to that, but fortunately, most of the time, we can keep them, keep them running okay. through it. Yeah. Um, and some testing to do. So, you know, some tests at home, um, a, a test I like, uh, which from uh, from Tom Groom for a run tolerance test. So basically, you know, do a run, see how far you can get keeping the pain at a four or five out of 10, making sure that it doesn't go above that, that for the next day. Uh, and then you then use, you know, decrease 10% of this, and then you actually then run that again. Yeah. And so that, that can be your run. So you sort of work out, okay, what's my limit? Back off from that a little bit. Let's run with that, and then gradually, yeah. gradually progress from there. So the running loads are really, really important, and, and uh, yeah, that's, that's something we're often tweaking for the runner and their run all the way back. Yeah, yeah. And that's it. That's that sort of covers. Yeah, that covers and, covers and a lot there. And just going through this makes uh, you, it more clear to me that you really need to say someone about this because thinking you can just run through it on your own often um, you you don't deload enough. You don't. Um, mm. I just think it's it's really important to to get it looked at. Yes, that's right, and then like we said in you know in, in our previous one, cars range, you know we don't just want to rest these things. You no, know, it's not right. just a matter of oh yeah, I'm just going to sit back and wait for it to go away because yeah. you get deconditioning, you get yeah. weakness around there. You're not addressing what why it happened in the first place, whether it was a training error or whether it was 
you know, whether it was strength related. Yes. So really making sure that you take action on it and, and yes. get it, get a plan, work out how to uh, how to get through this and and how to keep you running and, and stop you from stop it from becoming a you know a chronic recurrent cycle. Yeah. All righty. So if you are feeling any of those symptoms, make sure you go and get it checked out, um, and that way you can get back to running pain free sooner rather than later. Anyway, thank you very much, Luke. We really appreciate your time. Thanks again, Israel. Thank you. Thanks.